now. Uh, welcome again, uh, everyone. We're happy to have uh, Fatini Kunemu today uh, from uh, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and, and she's going now to give the first lecture on neutrino astrophysics and, and astronomy. So please, Fatini. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mauricio, for the introduction, and thank you, Marcus and Mauricio, for putting this together and for this uh, opportunity. Uh, so I, I would like to briefly start by saying something about me, uh, because my own background actually uh, kind of pointed me to how to organize these lectures, because of course neutrino astronomy and astrophysics is a big topic. So I'm uh, based at NTNU in Trondheim, uh, and my main research interests are related to the origin of the highest energy cosmic rays and the origin of high energy neutrinos. Um, and uh, I will, uh, um, and sp specifically one of the candidate sources which I have um, a, a great interest in is active galactic nuclei. And for those of you that don't have an astronomy background, these are galaxies that host a supermassive black hole in the center, which is active. This means there is a lot of accretion and a lot of emission in addition to the stellar emission. Uh, so inadvertently, I will discuss active galactic nuclei a bit more in these lectures than everything else as possible as candidate sources of these uh, extreme messengers, which are high energy cosmic rays and neutrinos. Um, let's see, uh, the plan for today is mostly to go through experimental facts and only a few basic theoretical concepts so as to set the scene. Uh, and then for the next lectures, uh, the, the first thing that uh, we're going to do next is look at what we already know about the sources of neutrinos. And I can already give away what, that we don't know what the sources are. But the observations that we have so far give us some sense of the generic properties that the source population ought to, to have in order to be able to uh, explain the neutrino flux that we observe. So this will be the second major focus of, of this uh, series of lectures. And after we have covered that, uh, my plan is to go through the most likely candidate astrophysical populations, again here active galactic nuclei feature prominently, uh, also starburst galaxies, these are galaxies which are undergoing intense star formation, um, and then transient sources which are related to the death of uh, massive stars, gamma ray bursts, uh, pulsars, and tidal disruption events, and see what characteristics they have which make them uh, good candidates for high energy particle acceleration, and what do we know already from the observations we have so far as to whether they may be the sources of the majority of or of some of the neutrinos that we are observing. Uh, okay, and I have a list here, so I hope that you will leave the summer school uh, and want to explore the topic more. So I put here a few uh, references which you can look at. The first two deal mostly with neutrinos and cosmic rays and their phenomenology. Um, the final one is a book which is actually freely available on the archive. And that deals more with the physics inside the sources, particularly active galactic nuclei. And I hope you may refer to these. And I also encourage you to look at many excellent reviews that have been written about high energy neutrinos, particularly since the birth of neutrino astronomy or extragalactic neutrino astronomy, which one might uh, relate to the ice cube discovery of neutrinos. So uh, th there are many pedagogical Review so you can look at for more information. Okay, so with this, uh, let me try to set the scene with this picture. And my idea was here to show this is a lecture about neutrino astronomy. Uh, my idea was to put in context uh, what we know about the universe and where the neutrinos fit in. Um, so what's shown here is all the different uh, uh, wavelengths in which we see uh, uh, emission in the universe, mostly non-thermal emission. 
So starting from low energies, we have radio emission either related to processes like electrons producing synchrotron emission in astrophysical sources. And most famously, we have the cosmic microwave background, which is the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. Uh, at slightly higher energies, we have incredible detail. We have optical observations mostly related to stellar processes uh, and infrared observations. Um, again, here we have fantastic resolution. Uh, and that's what we typically think of when we think of astronomy. At higher energies, so for example, at when we reach X-ray energies, we're starting to see emission that comes from particles. So um, accelerated electrons, again, accretion processes around um, you know, very strong gravity uh, in compact objects, compact astrophysical objects. And then beyond X-rays, we have gamma rays, which reach between, uh, typically we call gamma rays photons, which have energy up between 100 MeV um, and a few hundred TeV. One TeV is 10 to the 12 electron volts, one MeV is 10 to the 6 electron volts. And here, again, we're seeing the emission of the relativistic electrons, possibly also protons. We will discuss this in these lectures. Um, but what's important is that beyond about 1 TeV, we cannot see the light because the gamma rays interact with uh, um, several, there are several uh, cosmic photon backgrounds, but primarily with the cosmic microwave background. And this plot here shows that a PV photon uh, has such uh, an important opacity to undergo because it's, this is the peak of the temperature of the CMB uh, the spectrum that it can only travel from inside the Milky Way. So beyond the Milky Way, we cannot really see well with, uh, with gamma rays. But then uh, what comes to the rescue is neutrinos. So neutrinos, astrophysical neutrinos, have been observed with energies up to a few times 10 to the 15 electron volts. That's one PEV, uh, 10 to the 15. Uh, and maybe they can tell us something about the high energy universe, which we otherwise can't see with light. And if we're extremely interested in the, the high energy frontier, the, what comes next is the highest energy cosmic rays. So we have detected cosmic rays with energy up to, up to the 20 electron volts. And um, the problem with them is that they are charged particles. So the universe is filled with magnetic fields and so they, not, they cannot necessarily point us back to their sources. In fact, we've been making experiments uh, for many decades, and so far we don't have a clear idea what are the sources of these cosmic rays. This is one of the biggest mysteries uh, for over a century. Um, but uh, the cosmic rays and the neutrinos and the gamma rays are related, as we're going to see. And so possibly they may be uh, pieces to the same puzzle, or maybe there are more than one puzzles and there are uh, more than one types of sources that produce these different messengers. Okay, so I, I will just briefly start with the cosmic rays where in my opinion, everything starts. So the seminal moment here was in the early 1900s where um, physicists understood that there was a lot of ionizing radiation. They didn't know whether it comes from radioactive processes uh, in the Earth or whether it was cosmic in origin. So Victor has uh, made these very daring balloon flights uh, where he reached more than five kilometers in altitude with his balloon and with an electroscope and there, where he proved that at the high, at high in the atmosphere, the cosmic ray uh, level increased uh, and that therefore cosmic rays were in fact cosmic particles. Uh, and uh, in the, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for this uh, discovery. And this is what the, the cosmic ray spectrum looks like. So here we have flux of particles as a function of energy. And the cosmic rays that Victor Hess were measuring, was measuring are up here. They have a relatively low energy but they are very numerous. Uh, and what's interesting about this cosmic ray spectrum is that it keeps going for more than 
uh, you know, for many, many decades in energy, and the flux drops very fast. Uh, so we need a very big detector if we're going to measure, if we're going to uh, measure high energy cosmic rays, and that's what in fact happens. So beyond um, a few uh, TV, we start to need uh, huge detectors to, to detect cosmic rays. Um, and here, I just want to, because we're, as we're going to see in a moment, cosmic rays and neutrinos are so related, I just wanted to, to point out that, so now this is the same spectrum as before, but it has been multiplied by E, by energy to the power 2.5. And you're going to see this kind of bizarre multiplications in energy when you look at cosmic ray and neutrino plots. And the reason is that flux is so steeply falling. Uh, that if we want to see any any structures in the spectrum, we have to to manipulate the, the, the data in this way to, to to highlight the structures. And I wanted to say that we don't know the sources of these highest energy particles, but we do think that uh, you know we do understand pretty well that these are at the highest energy, very likely from outside our own galaxy. And the way that we know this primarily has to do with the fact that we don't detect any anisotropy, any excess of, of, of these uh, cosmic rays in directions where we would expect them if they come from our own galaxy. But also here, I just wanted to, 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 to let you think about this concept that in fact, uh, our own galaxy cannot even confine the cosmic rays with the energy 10 to the 20. So if we take the typical size of the Milky Way, I put here a kiloparsec, maybe a little bit less in the disk, um, just order of magnitude and the magnetic field, we measure it in various ways and it's of order a few microgauss. Now the gyro radius of a particle with energy E and charge Z in a magnetic field of strength B in the ultra relativistic limit is given by this by this formula, and if we put the numbers of the size and the and the magnetic field strength in the Milky Way, what we find out is that the 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 Larmor radius of a particle of energy ten to the eighteen point five electron volts is basically the same as the size of the Milky Way. This means that particles with energy exceeding this are not going to be contained in our galaxy. So this is just a, another argument why the cosmic rays are likely extragalactic, even though there could be localized sources inside the Milky Way with a strong magnetic field, and we're going to look at such options later um, in these lectures. So here, this is a sketch where I want to illustrate the connection between highest energy cosmic rays, neutrinos, and also gamma rays. So we observe these cosmic rays. So we know that there are very likely astrophysical sources where these uh, cosmic rays are accelerated. And there are photon fields inside the source environment. And there are photon fields also in the, in the intergalactic medium, the cosmic micro uh, background uh, primarily. And so, now these uh, original cosmic rays, they interact with these photons. Uh, doesn't matter which photons. All that matters is the energy of the photons and their number density. And they produce a pion. This is a process where the proton loses a, a substantial amount of its energy, about 20%. And the pion decays. And during the decay, we get a new neutrino. And then the muon also decays and we get a muon uh, antineutrino and then electron neutrino. Now, on average, each of these neutrinos takes a fourth of the energy of the pion so that you see that uh, we started with an, a proton of a particular energy and we end up with a neutrino on average with an energy 1 20th of the energy of the parent proton. Um, and meanwhile, um, the neutral pions that are produced also in this process, they de decay to two gamma rays, and each of the gamma rays ends up with about a tenth of the energy of the proton. So we have, we see how the 
existence of ultra high energy cosmic rays already before we had detected any cosmic neutrinos already let us know that there are cosmic neutrinos to be found. Uh, and it let us know where the, the peak of their flux should be because we knew the flux of cosmic rays. That's what we measured. And we have also gamma rays, but unfortunately, as I said before, they, they, they uh, are stopped by their interactions in the extragalactic background light, in the, the CMB. Uh, but we might see them at lower energies. They cascade down to lower energies. I think we'll cover this a bit more later in maybe tomorrow. Okay, so um, um, now I want to start the discussion of what might be the accelerators of the neutrinos. Um, and so uh, again, the minimum requirement for an accelerator of uh, high energy particles is confinement. This means that is not a sufficient condition, uh, but we need to be able to confine the particles in the magnetic field of the accelerator. Um, and uh, this is the formula that we saw before. The, the Larmor radius of the cosmic ray, uh, which has energy E and charge Z, has to be smaller than the radius of the source in the magnetic field of that source we're looking at. So we can turn this equation around and determine the maximum energy that can be confined in a particular accelerator. And this is the expression. And so we can use this uh, uh, kind of hand wavy argument to see where can we get to with a particular magnetic field and size. So you know that on Earth, at most, we can get to about one TeV uh, or a little bit more with the Large Hadron Collider. Some of you might have seen this recent publication which proposes um, a, a collider on the moon. So they are ambitious and they propose that we could use the entire circumference of the moon uh, to build a collider. And uh, if we were to do that, we would get to a few PeV. Um, but now we know that we have cosmic rays with energy 10 to the, uh, the 20 electron volts. So here I just, for those of you who haven't heard these names before, one EEV, I might use this, this is 10 to the 18 electron volts, and one ZEV is 10 to the 21 electron volts. So just for, to give an idea of the scale, we will need something like an accelerator which has the orbit of the, you know, the size of the orbit of Mercury in order to get to 10 to the 20 electron volts in energy. So we're looking for some really um, extreme places in the universe, this is for sure. Now starting actually low in energy and with the neutrino sources that we know, the, the first source that we knew was the sun. Uh, so during, for example, uh, the sun has spectacular flares and coronal mass ejections. And during these events, there are shocks formed which allow the acceleration of particles to beyond uh, GeV energies. And so it was known that the sun produces, or it was thought guaranteed that the sun produces neutrinos uh, through the proton proton chain. So in the proton proton chain, the two protons fuse into a deuterium, uh, and that process produces a neutrino. However, that neutrino is actually low energy. This is the, the process which produces most of the flux, but it requires special uh, interactions which can only be done with uh, special chemicals in the detector. So it's not always the preferred method. Uh, otherwise, we can keep going in the cycle, then the deuterium fuses with another proton to produce helium-3, and the helium-3, two of them can fuse to produce a helium-4. So now we have helium-3 and helium-4, which can uh, fuse to produce beryllium-7. And now the beryllium-7 has several two options. It can either capture an electron to go to a more stable state, which is the lithium-7, and that produces a neutrino. And this produces about 7% of the neutrinos from the sun, or otherwise it can capture a proton and become a, a turn to a boron eight, which then uh, inverse beta decays and produces a high energy and MeV neutrino. 
And in fact, this is, uh, well, at first people also tried uh, this process, so for example, in the home, homestick mine, uh, by having chlorine in the detector, but otherwise if one wants to have a water detection of neutrinos, um, you see here, uh, the highest energy neutrinos are produced by this process and they can be detected with water sharing of uh, techniques. Um, so this is what in fact, uh, uh, probably here, super Kamiokande for at first and later Super Kamiokande is just somehow the most celebrated of these uh, uh, detectors, by far not the only one. Uh, what we see here is uh, 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 inside the, an underground mine in, Kamio, in the Kamioka mine, uh, uh, a 50,000 50, ton uh, water detector and the, the the walls are lined with photomultiplier tubes. So when we have a muon neutrino coming into the detector, it produces a muon and that uh, produces the uh, Cherenkov cone, uh, which we see then uh, in the photomultiplier tubes. And um, if we have a muon, then we see a nice ring because there is no uh, multiple scattering of the muon. If we have an electron neutrino, which produced an electron inside the detector, then we end up with a kind of fuzzy ring like this. And this is what allows this detector to, to do uh, flavor identification, basically. So um, Super Kamiokande, or at the time it was Kamiokande, is also famous because of the second uh, neutrino source that we know of. This is supernova 1987a. So this is the nearest supernova uh, that we have observed after uh, after the 16th century, basically. So it happened in the small Magellanic cloud. The distance is about 50 kiloparsecs. And here you see the field before the explosion and after. So this was really spectacular. And it has been an extremely spectacular event for astronomy. Uh, it is still being studied by astronomers for various uh, different uh, reasons, but it's also very famous uh, for neutrinos because two hours before the explosion, Kamiokande detected 12 neutrinos uh, this, uh, at the kind of you know, at a consistent time, more or less at the same time, another detector uh, in the US, the Irvine Michigan Brookhaven detector detected eight neutrinos and another detector in the former Soviet Union uh, called Baksan, Baksan telescope detected another five neutrinos. So this was a momentous event. And again, it led to a Nobel prize in 2002. Um, now, um, the energy of these neutrinos was uh, of order at most 50 MeV. So if we remember, uh, this uh, factor of 20 between the parent proton energy and the neutrino energy, then the neutrinos from supernova 1987A are still somewhere up here where we have a, a large flux, but relatively high cosmic ray energy. And so are the neutrinos from the sun. So we still have 10 orders of magnitude to go in terms of energy. And this is illustrated in this uh, plot here where it shows the predicted, and in some cases this is actually measured for these two sources, but most, mostly this is the predicted neutrino flux. Again, it's a number flux as a function of neutrino energy. Um, and we see here the cosmological neutrinos, which uh, you will talk about in the cosmology lectures. Up here are the two sources that we discussed. And at higher energies, we have quite a lot of act activity. So uh, I don't want you to pay too much attention to these names because uh, these are just predictions uh, and they are somehow debatable. But uh, what's clear is that there is a, an astrophysical flux here. Now, two, two important things that I wanted to point out were the following. First of all, the, how 
quick is the drop in the flux. So that means that the detector like Super Kamiokande cannot help us to detect these neutrinos. We're going to need a detector of order 10 to the five times larger. And the other thing is this atmospheric background. So you see that for most of this energy range, actually the astrophysical neutrinos are hidden by uh, atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, one fortunate thing is that uh, very likely, even before we had the neutrino detection, it was clear that the, the, the slope of the spectrum is different for the astrophysical neutrinos, so that they could eventually, at high enough energies, pop up from underneath the background. Okay, so these were the challenges, the backgrounds, and the huge detector volume needed, and this is now the current uh, state of the field of high energy neutrino detection. So there are two detectors currently operating in their full configuration. There is IceCube in the South Pole and there is Antares in the Mediterranean Sea. So IceCube is uh, deep in the Antarctic ice and you see that there is quite a lot of uh, over overburden here which uh, shields from uh, cosmic rays. And down here are strings of photomultiplier tubes, which are uh, the, instru the instrumented volume. Um, a similar principle, again, both these detectors use uh, Cherenkov, the Cherenkov uh, light to detect neutrinos. Similar principle is used in Antares. Here again, the detector is deep in the sea. Uh, there are different backgrounds, of course, in the sea and then in the ice. Um, and it's a smaller detector. So Roughly speaking, Antares is the size of Amanda, which is the precursor to Ice Cube. Okay, and I just wanted to give a quick uh, uh, reason for excitement that there are currently many more detectors being built uh, for the detection of high energy neutrinos. Most advanced at this moment is one in Lake Baikal, um, which you can see here uh, in Russia. And also the, the follow-up to Antares, which is called the KM3Net, and it's, meant, it's going to be in its final stage the size of IceCube. It's also actually several uh, um, uh, st strings were deployed very recently in, in April. And there's another initiative also in, in the Pacific Ocean, which is currently in R&D stage. Okay, so that means that we're gonna soon see a lot more neutrinos. Uh, a little bit about the principle of detection. So typically we have either a, a muon or an electron or a tau neutrino, and it interacts, the muon typically, the muon neutrino interacts outside the detector most of the time, not always. Then we have an energetic muon that passes through the detector uh, and creates Cherenkov light. And here are the photomultiplier tubes that lit up for, uh, specifically for this event. Now, um, a, couple, a couple more things to think about, about the problems if we want to do high energy neutrino astronomy. So here I put a, a picture of several um, showers, and these are all uh, showers that are in, produced uh, in interactions of cosmic rays, be it in an astrophysical accelerator, be it even in a, in a man-made accelerator, a collider, and also in the you know, in their intergalactic propagation, as well as in, in the Earth's atmosphere. And here, if we compare to the, to the universe, the, the scale is smaller because the, the atmosphere is denser. And we have, you know, uh, pions produced in the interactions of the cosmic rays and the pions either interact or decay to produce muons. And these muons are a really a difficult problem for a neutrino detector. So there are two kinds of backgrounds that one has to care about. Uh, one is the cosmic ray muons directly. So um, the way that ice cube and neutrino detectors in general deal with this kind of background is that cosmic ray muons can actually not travel so far inside the Earth. So if we look for, now this is ice cube and this is a schematic uh, drawing of the Earth. If we look for, uh, 
neutrinos that come only from the northern hemisphere in ice cubes, so they've gone through the Earth, then we can essentially eliminate the cosmic ray muons. But we still have to worry about uh, neutrinos, which come from these cosmic rays. And these basically we cannot eliminate. They look identical to a, to a muon neutrino and or to an astrophysical neutrino. Um, and they're an irreducible background. But as I said earlier, thankfully, we, we know their spectrum. They should follow the cosmic ray spectrum. So we can eliminate them statistically or by looking at extremely high energies. So in fact, in 2013, uh, this was a very exciting time because IceCube announced the detection of a new population of neutrinos. Here we see the number of events, events that IceCube saw as a function of energy deposited in the detector, and the red, uh, uh, the red region shows us what the atmospheric um, neutrino background is expected to be, and the black points are the, the events that IceCube saw. So it's clear that there is at all energies in excess with respect to the expected atmospheric background. Uh, and at the highest energies, the situation is good because we don't expect any background. So we can look at the particular neutrino and say this has a high probability of being astrophysical. And just for illustration, this is the size of uh, one of the highest energy events that IceCube uh, so superimposed up over the city of Madison, where IceCube has their headquarters, just to show how impressive the size of this experiment is. Okay, uh, I want to just spend a brief second talking about the topologies of the different events. For astrophysical purposes, this is actually important. So if we have a muon uh, neutrino, this produces, I uh, showed this earlier, a muon that goes through the detector. And that allows for excellent uh, angular resolution because we have all this information um, of, of order a degree or less. And this is a real friend if we want to do astronomy. So for most of what we're going to talk to cover in these lectures, we will think about these muon neutrinos. Now, if we have an electron neutrino, this produces a shower inside the detector and this kind of messy cascade. Um, so the angular resolution is a bit poorer of order 10 degrees or more. And just um, for information, this is not a very important channel in general in IceCube, but it has been detected. Uh, there are also what's called double bang events. If a tau neutrino is uh, detected with just the right energy, so then we have first uh, one shower which comes from the decay of the tau neutrino, then the tau lepton, uh, before it, once it decays inside the detector, it produces the second shower. And here the angular resolution varies. So I wanted to illustrate the scale of the problem. So I went to Simbad. For those of you who don't have a background in astronomy, this is the world's largest astronomical database and you can query in many ways by saying the name of the source or the coordinates of the source. And I put in the coordinates of one uh, of the early ice cube neutrinos, which is a cascade event, an electron neutrino, uh, and also the, defined the radius to be the size of the angular uncertainty of that neutrino. And what came back is more than 100,000 objects. These are primarily galaxies. And that illustrates the difficulty in doing neutrino astronomy. Even if I were to put one degree here, you can, uh, you know, we can just do the difference in the solid angle. Still, there is a huge number of sources. Um, and this is the problem. The universe is a very big place. When we look for sources, there are many possibilities. Okay, so this is what the sky distribution of the neutrinos looks like. Um, this is one year of data, and this is in galactic projection, meaning that ice cube is somewhere here, and this is the southern sky, this is the northern sky. And the differences in the, uh, what looks like a different pattern in the two hemispheres is just to do with a different effective area of ice cubes. So in the southern hemisphere, the effective area is smaller because the detector can only, parts of the detector can be used to ensure high quality um, neutrinos. Uh, so, of order 100,000 neutrinos are detected every year, 
About a hundred of them are astrophysical, but not all of them can be distinguished from atmospheric neutrinos, uh, if you remember the plot from before. And about 10 of them have such a high energy that they're with high probability astrophysical uh, above, above about 60 TV. This depends on the, on the declination of each event. And we can more or less use them to do astronomy. Um, this is a sky map of most of the high energy neutrinos that IceCube has detected so far. Um, so now this is an equatorial projection. So IceCube is down here. And here there are several features I wanted to highlight. So first of all, okay, up here, we don't have so many neutrinos because of the absorption that they would have had to go through the whole earth. But apart from that, we can remark that the distribution of the neutrinos is quite isotropic. Um, specifically, now this is the galactic plane, and this is one of the major results from IceCube already from the early days. If we look at the galactic plane, we don't see a strong concentration of these neutrinos. This tells us that these neutrinos are, in their majority, extragalactic. Some of them may be galactic, of order 15% or, or less, but there is for sure an extragalactic source population. Of, of these neutrinos uh, as well. And now many people have done um, analyses um, uh, looking for correlations of the neutrino arrival directions with what is the known positions, for example, of active galactic nuclei, of uh, gamma ray bursts. And so far, there has been no strong association signal. A few uh, excesses have be found, been found but there is no uh, conclusive study to this day that would tell us what the sources of the neutrinos are just from their arrival directions that we know so far. Another thing that IceCube does, and uh, which is an obvious thing to do once we have such a neutrino population, is to look for point sources. And uh, how do we look for point sources in this first map that you saw, which is full of uh, primarily atmospheric neutrinos? Uh, we can have an, a clustering algorithm basically and look for hotspots in the map. Um, this is what has been done in this analysis. And what was found is that the hottest spot in the sky is the one shown here. This is an equatorial coordinates. And uh, it's coincident with the, a nearby galaxy called NGC 1068. This is really quite interesting because um, this is an active galactic nucleus that was used to define what we will talk about tomorrow, which is the unification of AGN. Um, uh, so this is an important source. Um, but the statistical significance is not uh, so high yet. It's uh, with the order three sigma or about there is about one chance, one in 500 times that one sees such a high excess of uh, events by chance. And we will talk a little bit more about this source later. Uh, another... Uh... Patini? Yeah. Uh, there, there's a question in the chat by Priti Frash. Uh, I will read it. Why is it so important to find the sources for the neutrinos? Does it have any special contribution to the problem? Okay, uh, yes, thank you for this question. Well, I mean, this is um, my job in a way <laughs> because uh, this is the mystery what produces such high energy particles in the universe. Um, if we weren't to find the sources, what could we do with these neutrinos? Um, except particle physics. Um, do you have some thoughts? Do you want to uh, say something about this, Preeti? Actually, I just wanted to know whether uh, the detection process, maybe like uh, if it is from a particular source, uh, that could have some special effects on the detection part. But if, uh, if it is from different sources and still we are getting a final output as a neutrinos, then it is the same, I believe. Mm. I'm actually, I did, I didn't fully understand your comment. You're saying from the detection point of view, it does not matter what are the sources. Uh, yes, if we 
like yeah we are getting six uh, six flavors of neutrinos uh uh from uh, different sources it doesn't matter what is the source yes so again let let me repeat what what i said before it really matters in astrophysics so this is the the, the, the really the main question uh, at least uh, in in my mind and i'm sure in many of my colleagues mind that we want to find the source of these neutrinos because um, just like the cosmic rays, we don't know where they come from. They're a great mystery, but they're certainly some really extreme, unique accelerators. So I, I don't know if they're unique, actually. This is uh, not, not clear. In fact, they seem to be quite abundant. But from the point of view of detection, it does not make a big difference because any kind of source, unless the sources are galactic, should be more or less uniformly distributed in the sky. Does this answer your question or? Yes, it answers perfectly. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> another so another uh, way to understand the here is what we call also the sensitivity of a particular neutrino detector to different astrophysical signals is looking at this kind of plot. Here we have the flux, again, this is a differential in energy flux as a function of the declination uh, of the sources. So this is the northern equatorial hemisphere and this is the south. And what's illustrated is uh, what I mentioned before, that the sensitivity of ice cube is actually much better in the north. So the neutrinos that are through going than in the south. Uh, and if we look at this dashed blue line here, this is the upper limit. So if IceCube does not see any excess of neutrinos in a particular direction, this is the upper limit that it can place on the any, any kind of neutrino source as a function of declination. So this is one useful. Uh, is there another question? Yes, there's another ah, question. Okay. I, I can read it uh, to everyone. IceCube detects, is this from Aman Gupta? Uh, IceCube detects both atmospheric and extragalactic neutrinos. How? Will you distinguish which neutrinos are atmospheric or astrophysical? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Aman. So let's go back to this plot here. So this is the sum of neutrinos that IceCube detects is this black line, okay? And if I see a neutrino here at this energy, there is no way that I can tell whether it's atmospheric or, or astrophysical. I hope you agree. I can only say statistically that there is an excess of events and there must be some astrophysical neutrinos there. And the way we know the atmospheric background is we measure the cosmic rays very well and we understand all the interactions of the cosmic rays. We have models. So this line is quite robust. Um, uh, so, up down here, I cannot distinguish between the two. Now, if I see tomorrow a neutrino with energy one PeV, which is here, uh, then the atmospheric background here, you can see that it's completely uh, gone. So it has a very high chance of being astrophysical. It's not a hundred percent chance. It might be, you know, it's a statistical statement again, but the higher the energy, the lower the probability that this would be. An astrophysical, uh, an atmospheric neutrino. Does I hope that this answers the question. But uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yes, professor. So I mean, uh, the only criteria is the energy. I mean, the typical energy of astrophysical is of the order of some uh, TeV or PeV. But uh, the I mean, there can be an atmospheric neutrinos which uh, which can be of the order of uh, TeV. So, I mean, are there any other differences rather, uh, I mean, accept this energy criteria? No, but the spectrum is also important. So, but, so the spectral shape is also important. Uh, so if I, but if I measure a few neutrinos and they all have a spectral shape, let's say, which is something like a straight line here, um, that's a harder spectrum than we expect from the atmospheric background. But again, we need an ensemble of neutrinos in order to make this statement. If I just take one neutrino, there is no way to tell. 
yes right and in this plot i mean at a higher and higher energy i can see a lot of uncertainties in this i mean the right side here so, yes these are upper limits this means there was no neutrino detected but there is okay, some and, uh, area so at most the flux is this much otherwise we would have detected something yeah uh, okay yeah thank you thank you professor okay very welcome so i see there is now another question it yes. says is there, uh, sorry hmm? go ahead please yeah so is there any delay or blackout between Oh, I don't think so. I think you can have many neutrinos in the detector at the same time. But actually, I'm not in IceCube, so maybe also Marcus could comment on this. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I should say we also have like a dedicated IceCube talk uh, actually later today. Maybe we can also talk about IceCube at that point. So uh, we, we see uh, lots of events per second, like thousands of events uh, per second. Most most of these events are background events. And as you summarize, uh, you only have like per year about 100 very energetic uh, events above 100 TV or so. But uh, yeah, so uh, successive detection, uh, I mean, if you have like a cluster of events, not only in space and time, this can also be an interesting way of discovering those. We're probably going to talk about time dependent sources as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you, Marcus. And okay, so I hope this also answers the question. Then, actually, I was not aware that there is an ice cube talk, so maybe we will hear a few things twice, but that may be okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me then quickly finish with this. Uh, I see also that we're a little bit behind where I had wanted to get to. Um, but uh, yes, there are also upper limits that ice cube can place on a source by source basis. That means if I know that I think the particular source is a good candidate and I don't see any neutrinos, I can say something about the neutrino emission of that source also by not detecting any neutrinos. And these are these black points. And we will discuss a little bit about what whether these black uh, upper limits are already uh, important for astrophysics tomorrow. And finally, uh, regarding the detection of neutrinos, I wanted to show this plot. So now we have a, the axes here are energy flux. Uh, so energy squared multiplied by the differential flux. And this is a really great plot, uh, a, a great way to plot things because for two reasons. So first of all, in astrophysics, uh, canonical particle spectrum follows an e to the minus two power law. And so if we plot an e to the minus, this is, for example, from Fermi acceleration, from shock acceleration. So if we have such a power law and we plot it in these units, then we get a straight line. And another thing about this straight line is that straight lines in these axes tell us that there's the same energy content in different energy bins. Um, so already we can now, here we see the ultra high energy cosmic rays at the highest energies. And we see that uh, and the neutrinos that IceCube has detected with two different analyses here. And down here, we see gamma rays that have been detected with the Fermi satellite. And what's very interesting about this plot is that before the ultra high energy cosmic rays meet their own cutoff, which is very steep, they have more or less the same energy content as the neutrinos that have been detected with ice cube. And this is one uh, reason why people have, many people think that there may be a connection or between these two messengers. It could of course also be a coincidence, uh, but it's a very interesting uh, one. In any case, it could simply be that the sources are the same. They don't have to be the same because the neutrinos don't have to be produced by cosmic rays with energy 10 to the 18.5 can be also a little lower. And we're going to explore this in detail tomorrow. We will talk about uh, the benchmark flux of neutrinos uh, that comes from ultra high energy cosmic rays. So with this, let me go on. So I think I have 10 minutes and okay. So during this time, I think we can start to talk about the second part, which is the generic constraints that we can place on the sources of, uh, of these high energy neutrinos from the observations that we have so far. And here, what I would like to cover is first of all, what 
can be learned simply by considering the maximum energy, uh, maximum acceleration energy in different types of sources. And then I would like to us to explore the possible connection to of a high energy neutrinos seen with ice cube and ultra high energy cosmic rays. Uh, and then we are going to discuss the required energy budget and also the inferred number density of uh, neutrino sources. So I think today we'll just go through the first part. So here, the argument is the same as before. Uh, the, it's the argument of confinement. So we have a new, we have detected in ice cube neutrinos with energy up to a few PeV, few times to the 15 electron volts, that tells us that these sources have uh, uh, produced um, cosmic rays with energy 10 to the 17 electron volts or more. And uh, we have as a function of the size of the source and the magnetic field strength of the source, a requirement, a minimum requirement such as to be able to reach this energy. And I plotted it uh, here. So if we're above this blue line, we're in a region of the parameter space where the accelerators have sufficient, uh, they, they can fulfill this confinement condition. And here I show the Large Hadron Collider. So we already knew that this can only accelerate protons to a few TeV. It does not produce neutrinos like the ones seen with ice cube. Uh, then if we put the Milky Way on this plot, it's somewhere down here, so it's much larger. It's also the magnetic field is much, the magnetic field strength is much lower, and it can barely reach this confinement condition. In fact, we're going to see in a moment, actually sources like the Milky Way probably do not produce the majority of ice cube neutrinos. And, but then there are other astrophysical sources that we do know, and they will form the, the, the most of the rest of, the, of these lectures. There are, for example, neutron stars, which have about 10 kilometer radius and they're highly magnetized. They are the remnant of the death of a massive star after a supernova, for example. And they have a very high magnetic field so they can easily reach these energies that we're looking at. Then and there are gamma ray bursts illustrated here. These are the most uh, extreme transient uh, events in the universe in terms of their energy output. And related to them are also tidal disruption events, uh, which we will so briefly look at. Uh, and they again have sufficient power and sufficient uh, magnetic field strength times uh, size to accelerate ultra high energy particles. Then there are starburst galaxies. They have the same size as normal galaxies, but they have strong magnetic fields and they drive strong winds. So they also are interesting candidate sources. And then there are active galactic nuclei. And here we will see tomorrow that there are many possibilities, all of them fulfilling this criterion. Now, I, what I wanted to say here is that if we were to be a little bit more realistic and look, for example, at shock acceleration, uh, we get a very similar equation about the maximum energy that, uh, uh, so particle acceleration in an astrophysical shock we get a similar equation uh, for the maximum energy, except that there is a numerical factor here, which is related to the speed of the shock and the time during which particles can be accelerated. And in most realistic situations, this factor is never one. So in a supernova, it's actually of order 0.01. In fact, it's less, but uh, that, that factor makes the requirements on accelerators more stringent. And in fact, that's why I said before, normal galaxies don't make it if we take any realistic uh, additional assumptions. And uh, now in reality, there are other losses. For example, the, while we accelerate these protons, they also may suffer synchrotron losses, especially if the magnetic field is high uh, and interactions. So reality is very complicated. And I guess that we don't know for sure that any of these sources uh, are making it to these energies. And that's why we're looking for them. I see there is a question. I'll take it in a moment because I, I'm about to finish what, what I'm saying here. Uh, I just wanted to say that if you remember the plot before, 
uh, and the fact that maybe the neutrinos and the cosmic rays come from the same source populations, then the requirements, of course, become much larger. So here, this, this plot shows the requirement for a 10 to the 20 electron volt proton. And you see that actually, we don't even know of any sources that uh, could do this job very well, maybe marginally. So there, we are left with fewer uh, possible options. Okay, so let me now address this question. Yes, so the question says, neutron stars emit neutrinos during their thermal evolution in the MeV range usually. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> okay, maybe- No, I no, can... go, go, go ahead with him. No, I, I asked her if, he, asked him if she wanted to do it, a question orally. You know, oh, okay. <laughs> so I can still respond. So the question is whether we can also see the MeV neutrinos with ice cube or other detectors. And the answer is yes. So actually, IceCube has an, an, an infill, um, and the in it, which, ha, which is sensitive to lower energy neutrinos. And there are all these detectors like Super Kamiokande have a, a very well established now uh, uh, system of alerting each other, and they are active. So they're looking for these neutrinos. But I will not talk much about these neutrinos today. They're a very important field of research and or actually even all of this week because this is just not my, my main focus. But yeah, absolutely, we can. Okay, I see that there is another question by Therese. Uh, yes, hello. I have a question regarding the particles leaving the accelerators. So in a galaxy, for example, could you have a particle leaving and accelerating accelerator and entering another one, especially like in the galaxy? Mm, so you mean like uh, if, we, if we have, so normally the cosmic rays are a kind of, you can imagine as a kind of soup going around the galaxy and you say, could they enter a like a blazer, for example, like a, se a second type of accelerator? Yes. Uh, in fact, they can. And this is a one important uh, proposed mechanism to accelerate cosmic rays twice. But only a very small fraction of them can do that because there's a magnetic field uh, normally, and so that might deflect them outside. Uh, but in, in some instances it's possible. And for example, it's thought that in AGN jets, some particles from the galaxy can enter the jet if they have the right direction and energy and they can get a second acceleration shot and reach ultra high energy. So that's actually an interesting idea. Thank you. Okay. Good, so um, I think we'll summarize here. So the take home messages for today are that so far we know only two sources of high energy neutrinos, the sun and the supernovae. So astronomy with neutrinos is currently small. On the other hand, we have a huge flux now seen with ice cubes. So uh, it's a very active field of research. Uh, and there are, as we saw, uh, there are possibly many sources that could be responsible for this flux, unless we require a connection to ultra high energy cosmic rays, then we have fewer options. Okay, so I stop here and thank you all. Thank you for questions? the news. I think we, in the interest of time, I think we, since we had uh, plenty of questions during the talk, I suggest that we leave any questions for the either the study time or the discussion session later in the afternoon, and then we break for lunch now. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop.